All right, Doug, I think we need at least two or three more microphones up here. Okay. <laughs> I don't have enough. Audio guys got some. Uh, this is good. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, my name is Barack Epstein from the Texas Theater mostly. Uh, I do a few other things. Um, who's been to the Texas Theater? You guys have been? Everybody's been? Awesome. Almost everybody. If you, if you haven't been, there's a couple things there. Maybe you'll come. Um, but yeah, what I was going to talk about a little bit uh, today was about what's going on, what's happened in the Texas Theater, what's happened a lot on, on Jefferson uh, over the years, and, and kind of, you know, arts in and how building some community in, 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 in Oak Cliff, but more specifically about what's going on, you know, how, how Jefferson's done it um, and, what's, and how that's changed and how maybe it, it will stay the same or how it will change over time. Because uh, it's a little different than other parts of Oak Cliff. Um, so just like a, just a quick recap slide about the history of the Texas Theater. Uh, this is the history of the Texas Theater. This is actually built in 1931 by Howard Hughes. Um, Howard, when they, when they always, that's like sort of the lore is that Howard Hughes built the tech. He owned it for a very short period of time in, in 1930 and 1931 uh, when he was buying up movie theater chains and, and, and reselling them. Uh, in theory, he was at the opening uh, on 11, on, uh, in April of 1931. There's no photos of it. Um, and then later on in 1963, 11 1963, Texas Theater became very famous as the place of Lee Harvey Oswald's capture. Um, did everyone know that? I don't have to talk about that that much. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, good. Everyone knows that. When people come, like touring comedians or whatever, they always want to sit in the seat and they always want to talk about it. And whenever I talk about the Texas Theater in other states, I just, have, I just quickly have to talk about it real quick. Um, so that's not what we're going to talk about here for, for a while. But then the theater was closed in 1989. It was actually kind of United Artists its whole time because uh, Howard Hughes's company changed in Rob, called Rob and Rowley, then it was Ra Rowley and United, then it was United Artists, and basically it was United Artists, it, one company from 31 to 1989. Uh, and then in 89, between 89 and about 2001, uh, it, there was a lot of starts and stops. It didn't, uh, some, you know, some miscellaneous groups ran it, they started it. People, I always like to say it was like that guy who was holding the flag in the Civil War, he would get shot and then another guy would pick up the flag and run. And then that would happen for like every six months for, for a while. Um, and uh, eventually uh, became own, ownered, owned by uh, a guy who worked at the theater, who Monty knows. Uh, and, and Monty over there was instrumental in, in uh, bringing back a group called the Oak Cliff Foundation. Um, and the Oak Cliff Foundation uh, was a nonprofit that was able to buy the theater in 2001, right? It was 2001. Uh, and in 2001 with the plan of, of bringing the theater back to life and restoring it and, and making it a thing again. Uh, and I want to talk about that again in a second. But um, in, in 2003, they got National Historic Registry, which was a huge deal. Uh, how, how was that complicated? Was that complicated to get? Yes. Yeah. Um, so now the Texas Theater is on, it's like the trifecta of historic stuff. It's, it's, the tex, it's a National Registry, uh, it's Texas historical, and this is an interesting one, a lot of people know, but the, the Texas Theater is actually uh, its own city of Dallas district. <laughs> if you look it up under the city records, it's, a city, it's the Texas Theater Historic District, which, is the, which encompasses the Texas Theater. Uh, it also encompasses the Oak Cliff Cultural Center right next door. Uh, so if anybody's been to the Oak Cliff Cultural Center, that was part of the Texas Theater's real estate. Uh, you know, it makes sense that it was. It was like a, it was like a restaurant at one point. Uh, and then in part of the, the dealings with the city, it was gifted back to the city. Right, Monty? Yep. Yeah. Monty's here, so I have to like ask him a lot of this stuff. Because <laughs> uh, he was, so, so I showed up around 2010, uh, so I wasn't there from anything before 2010. Uh, so we started a group uh, in 2010. It was a, it was a for profit operation called Aviation Cinemas um, that was the plan to lease the theater from the foundation and run it as an everyday uh, business. Um, and, uh, and in 2020, during COVID, um, we, we, we started a huge project to uh, reuse the balcony. So if anybody went there before the past two years, you may not have noticed, or maybe you did, that there was a balcony that no one went into. Uh, and it was sort of unusable. Um, and that was, even when we, when we started in 2010, we were like, we got to eventually figure out how to use the balcony. Either we're going to open it as a balcony again, or we're going to make it into a second screen. Um, 
And our whole thing is uh, we wanted it to have more, than, more things happening at once. Uh, so we were able to, to build it into a second screen uh, and, and still retain part of the balcony for the front screen. Has anybody been up, seen a movie upstairs yet? Sweet, Doug has. Um, so, so yeah, so let's talk a little more about it. Uh, I'm, okay, so I'm gonna backtrack for a second um, about to, to talk a little bit about Jefferson Boulevard. So Jefferson Boulevard um, was like a huge like shopping district in like the 30s and the 40s, right? Uh, this is some photos of it in the 40s as an overhead view. You can see the bones of it aren't that different than they are today. Actually, you could probably take this photo today and it would almost look identical. There's Jefferson Tower, it looks the same. There's some lofts, they look the same. There's Gonzales over there. There's Top 10 Records, there's the Texas Theater. Like these buildings are all there. Um, and this photo is 75 years old. Um, and um, so this is where people would go to get like their hat cleaned or buy some new shoes or buy some boots or buy, you know, it was basically North Park Mall before North Park Mall. And, and, it, was, and it was a big deal to come down to Jefferson Boulevard. Um, you know, times changed, people left, you know, white flight, all these things. But Jefferson became still, it was still a place where people went, even through, you know, maybe the 60s um, and 70s and 80s, um, but the demographics change. Um, so this is a photo that uh, is not on the internet. I only, I only put it in like little slides like this uh, because it's a Getty photo and they get mad at you if you put it on the internet. Um, but this, was, this is what was happening out in front of the Texas Theater on 11-22-63. Don't post this on Instagram because I'll, I'll get in trouble. Um, but uh, maybe a story post, they won't see it. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, so this lady's name was Julia Postal. She worked at the box office on 11-22-63. She was the one who, she saw uh, Lee Harvey Oswald go in and not buy a ticket. This, this photo, in theory, must have been later that day or the day after. Uh, I guess she was just counting receipts. But this kind of was a, t a, a turning tide and change for, for the theater and, and, for, and for Jefferson Boulevard. Um, and in the 70s and the 80s, these are just pictures of the Texas Cedar, but it kind of shows the change in the neighborhood a little bit. Uh, for whatever reason, they kept changing what it looked like, like the marquee kept changing. Like that's, I think, the 70s and that's the 80s. So they kept like covering it weirdly. The store next door was a furniture store. Different stores were happening. Um, but, you know, attendance was declining. People were leaving the neighborhood. Uh, people were moving to the suburbs. Um, okay, so fast forward to around 2000, 2001. This is what Jefferson looked like. This is what the Texas Theater looked like. Uh, it wasn't in good shape. You know, it was crumbling. Uh, there was talks of the Texas Theater maybe being, you know, turned into a furniture warehouse or, or maybe being torn down and, and, and other things like that happening. Um, and this is really where, where Monty, you know, came in and made things happen. This is a paragraph from uh, the City of Dallas um, agreement with the Oak Cliff Foundation from 2001, which I think was the very first uh, transaction that the Oak Cliff Foundation had with uh, the City of Dallas. And, and it was for uh, some good-sized loans that, this, that, the, that, that were meant to be uh, forgivable to the Oak Cliff Foundation to renovate the Texas Theater. Um, and, and there's, there's parts of this that, that are interesting. I always come back to this word, this word that says remove blight, which is what the city language, right? Because they, they didn't just mean the theater. They meant the whole street. Uh, there, there, there were, you know, people weren't coming down to Jefferson. Um, you know, Monty, I didn't go to Jefferson in 2000. What was Jefferson like in the year 2000, 99? It was pretty, uh, you know, it was pretty dangerous, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. We still have some pot shop, but, but, but we have a lot of good stuff too. Um, so, so this is, anyways, I wanted to show this because it was, it was, it was specific that the city of Dallas, part of why they gave this money was that they wanted the Texas Cedar to be the anchor for Jefferson Boulevard. Right, Monty? Yeah. yeah. And, and they thought that the redevelopment of the Texas Cedar could potentially change the direction of the whole street, which, which was, you know, 60 years before this, the big place in Dallas to go, and then by, by the late 90s was not a place you wanted to go, pretty much. Um, 
so they wanted to remove blight and they wanted to, and they notated, even, even in this era, that it was a historically significant entertainment venue and it could be again. Uh, and, and even though that there were groups out there saying, you know, tear, tear down the Texas Theater, all it talks, you know, the only thing, it's a terrible street and the only thing it's famous for is, is you know, connected with the thing that we don't want to talk about every day, which is, which is the JFK assassination. Um, but, but it happened. Um, and and this, 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 this contract actually changed about a hundred times since 2001 because it kept, uh, it kept, there were kept being revisions and additions and we kept having to go to city council uh, and add things to it. Um, and, and, and eventually, um, years, years later, uh, my group was able to uh, basically um, be assigned this contract. Uh, so we could get the old loans knocked out, and there was a there was a, 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 a thing added that said that we had to continually make improvements to the building, and the big improvement we wanted to make was to do the balcony, right? So so that's why uh, that's why I look at this thing every day. Um, by the way, this is a public document. It's on the city of Dallas's website. I I was going to just look for it in my files. Uh, last night when they were, because somebody called me and said, hey, do you have a preso? I was like, yeah, I have a preso. Let me just make one real quick. But um, uh, so rather than just search my finder, I just searched for Texas Theater City of Dallas Blight, and it's on the, and it came up faster than me searching, because uh, I knew that those words were, uh, were, were there. Um, so, fa you know, fast forward to a few years after 2001, you know, we're running the Texas Theater, you know, this is this is when we ran a first run movie, the first a new Star Wars movie opening day. We had a thousand people come to see it. You know, it was a big deal for us to get to get the Star Wars movies and, and, and be able to provide that to the community. Just I mean, so you know, it's a big thing I think from this picture to the picture before, uh, and uh, and we were able to, to to make that happen over the years. Um, so so just how the Texas Theater maybe connects with. Um, you know, loosely with, with, with Jefferson and maybe, you know, removing blight or in, helping to improve other restaurants and things like that. Obviously, we've had the charcoal broiler. The charcoal broiler doesn't need Texas Theater. Charcoal broiler could run, you know, for a hundred more years. It's fine. It's been there since the early 60s. It's, you know, hopefully you guys go there. It's the best place. It's, it's family run. They own the building. They have family business. They, that's, that's the way to do it. Gonzalez has been there since 73. And go a little further up, El ranchito has been there since 83. Um, and then we ha obviously have the Oak Cliff Cultural Center, which started right after we rebooted the Texas Theater in 2010, 2011, um, a as a great you know, city-run facility. Uh, Island Spot brings people in from all over the city just to go there. Uh, more recently, the Zaman, if you guys have been there, it's fantastic. Uh, and Trumpo, which just opened, which is awesome. Uh, and then Top Ten Records, which I'm going to talk about in a second, which, is, which has been on Jefferson since 1956. Uh, and then there's been other awesome places that have, you know, come and gone. I wish I could keep Cultivar on this slide, and I wish I could say that the Small Brew Pub made it. But those were places that wouldn't, maybe wouldn't have come if, if we hadn't been there. And they were successful for a while. Uh, and there's room for Je on stuff for Jefferson. If you guys were thinking about, uh, you know, putting something on Jefferson, it's probably cheaper than, than other parts of Oak Cliff. So, um, so come, come on down. Check with Monty first. Rent here first. But, uh, but come, come, down to, come down to Jefferson. Um, so I'll just, I'm going to talk a little bit about some other stuff, you know, since we've re renovated the theater, since we've added that second screen. Um, so this is kind of a photo you can kind of see, this wall up in the top. That wall wasn't there, that's where the other theater was, the, other the, the balcony was, and that's where the other theater is now. But now there's a row up there, see, people can sit up there, there's 25 people who can sit up there and sit in the original balcony and watch shows downstairs. Uh, this is a sold-out screening a few months ago of Scream with Matthew Lillard and Skeet Ulrich. They were there. You can see them sort of in the dark here. But, uh, but this was, um, this was uh, one of our ideas was when we built that balcony, we're like, okay, it's two different movies, but what if, what if we had a big event where we, we needed both screens? So this was, one of the, this was the time we did it. This was sold out, and Matthew Lillard and Skeet Ulrich are talking, and, Scre and Scream also played upstairs, and we just ran a video feed for them for the intro and Q&A. So we actually had 850 people watching Scream at the same time and watching this Q&A. So that was, a, that was a cool thing. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do more of this kind of stuff uh, when we bring in you know, uh, talent to come see movies. Um, so this, was, this is like the, the ar architectural picture of what we did, basically, right? 
So there's the downstairs theater, there's, there's Skeet Ulrich, uh, there's the, uh, the mezzanine where people can sit up there, and that's where the projection is, there's like the nifty little walk area. And then back there, there's a, seat, a, new, a different theater, it's completely soundproof, um, and uh, you, know, you couldn't tell one thing was happening for another. We had like a Latino hip hop concert downstairs a few months ago, and James Bond was playing upstairs, and people wouldn't notice that both things were happening, because our architects did a pretty good job with the soundproofing. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like if you come down. Um, and then just another view of, of what it looks like with no one, nobody in there. Um, and then here's the other theater upstairs. Uh, if you haven't been, come check it out. 165 seats, uh, fully ADA compliant. We have, an, we have a lift and an elevator that takes people up there if they need it. Uh, we, ha we have the hearing impaired and visually impaired uh, rigs for this theater. It was really difficult to even do that downstairs for various reasons, but we were able to do it upstairs. Um, so, um, so that's a good thing. Um, and um, here's just another picture of sold out events we've had in the past few months with people. This one's really dark. That's Joe Bob Briggs to, uh, to full out, sold out crowd talking in front of movies. That's kind of a lot of what we do besides just showing movies. We try to bring in people to talk about the movies or people who are on tour or people who have, there's a lot of fandom about them. Uh, Kevin Smith's coming in a few weeks to show Clarks 3, and that'll be sold out, and, and things like that. Um, we also you know, try to concentrate a lot on uh, you know, multimedia type of things, DJs after shows, behind the screen events. We have a space behind the screen, which we just call behind the screen, and usually it's like local punk bands or uh, electronic music behind the screen. This is uh, um, uh, Spinderella from Salt and Pepper DJing behind the screen a couple years ago. Uh, this was an event from the Oak Cliff Film Festival where everybody wore headphones and they got to hear a movie in ambisonic sound. Um, so just, just some examples of some fun stuff we've done. Uh, this next slide doesn't really correlate to this prezo, but it's in here because it's a good photo. Um, when, we, when we had to be closed during COVID and we were inside building the theater, uh, we were outside and showing movies in the parking lot, in the uh, city of Dallas operated parking lot, which they niftily added uh, lights for us for, and we were able to show movies out there. We showed, uh, we, sh we could fit 38 cars a night, and we sold out every night, pretty much every night we were open, which we were open like three or four nights a week. Did anybody come to the Sunset Drive-In by chance? You did. Um, we called it the Sunset Drive-In because that street is sunset. You can see the city of Dallas from up there pretty good. Um, so uh, it ran for, from July 2020 till April 2021, pretty much every weekend. Um, so that was, um, that was the Texas Theater. So I want to talk uh, about some other things on Jefferson that are, that are tangentially connected, but not exactly the same thing. Um, so, uh, so the Oak Cliff Film Festival is, uh, is, a, is a nonprofit uh, called the Oak Cliff Film Society. Uh, that has been run uh, since 2012, um, and it's, it takes place in the Texas Theater, but also takes place in other parts of Oak Cliff, like Gessler's Theater, Bishop Arts Theater Center, Wild Detectives. We've done events at Oak Cliff Brewing here. Uh, we, we try to do events all over Oak Cliff when possible. Um, and, and, and even though it's you know, sort of headquartered at the Texas Theater, it's not, um, it's not part of the Texas Theater's like, legal umbrella because we wanted to make it its own nonprofit uh, so we could uh, you know, get donations um, or you know, get people, they can do write-offs for their donations and sponsorships and also provide uh, education initiatives. The Oak Cliff Film Festival initially was under the nonprofit of the Oak Cliff Foundation, which was you know, the one that I talked to you about that, that uh, Monty started. Um, but then we turned it into its own uh, around 2017, um, so it could just be its own world. Um, so part of what it does every year besides showing movies, it shows movies every June uh, in, in a four-day festival. Um, it all, we also do uh, education programs. We do education programs at the Oak Cliff Cultural Center. Uh, we have also, we've also started doing an off-site, uh, more of a film-intensive thing for high school students, which I'm going to show you a short video of in a second. Um, uh, which we've been partnering with uh, for Oak Cliff. Uh, and we've been growing this thing every year. People, keep, people are coming out. Has anybody seen a movie at the film festival? Doug maybe has. You have. A few people have. So, yeah, I mean, you know, if, uh, if you're into, you know, more indie stuff or seeing indie filmmakers up on coming, traveling in, 
a big part of our budget every year is spent flying in every filmmaker we can. So that's, that's a, a lot of film festivals in this size don't really do that. They're just like, hey, if you're going to come, you can come on your own dime. But, you know, you got to get here. You know, we're trying to put people up, uh, trying to uh, get people, you know, hotel rooms, things like that. Uh, so we're, you know, we try to make it like a summer camp feel for these filmmakers who might be from New York, LA, Nashville, wherever. Um, and uh, so these are our dates for next year. So, so, so mark them down, but don't tell anybody because we haven't put anything on the internet yet. Uh, well, we usually announce our dates uh, in November um, and we start taking submissions. So if you, if you know any filmmakers who are, who are making a film, uh, tell them to submit to the Oak Cliff Film Festival. Uh, we'll take submissions from November probably till April. Um, you know, so shorts, features, docs, uh, you know, local interest stuff, any, anything, music videos. Um, you know, we love, we love local films. Um, so, uh, so that's what's going on with the Oak Cliff Film Festival. Uh, I'm going to show you this, this. I got a couple videos. This one's a shorty. Uh, this was uh, kind of a recap of uh, last year's film festival that we just posted for uh, North Texas Giving Day. Programming here at Oak Cliff is just amazing. Everyone just seems to love films. Oak Cliff is the best. You guys do it right. It's just a great place to be. Is yeah. So that was our hype video. Hopefully, people gave on North Texas Giving Day. Um, so, uh, just a couple other just pictures of the Oak Cliff Film Festival. Um, this one, I want to show part of a video for if, if I can. This was a this was a two day intensive event we did last May at Four Oak Cliff. Uh, which is in South Oak Cliff. Uh, they took over an old YMCA. They're doing great stuff in there. Uh, a lot of community engagement, and they're also they're, one of their big focuses is education and, and vocation. And that's kind of one of the things we talk about is, you know, how, teaching people how they can make films and how they can make money making films, uh, and how they can make a career out of filmmaking. Uh, whether it's you know actually you know making big narrative films or making commercials or making content for other people or mixing it all up, making music videos. So there's lots of different ways you can be in the industry and, and have a career in filmmaking, and we're trying to tell that to anybody who's in high school up to you know up to people changing their careers later later on. Um, so um, this is a short, a little longer of a video. Doug, how long have we got? We have three minutes. Yeah. All right, we're gonna watch this one. One of the missions of the Oakland Film Festival is to celebrate great independent filmmakers. A lot of times you want to meet the filmmakers who have, you know, made a couple films already, or done a walk a few times, they're industry professionals. We wanted to reach, you know, younger kids that, you know, are still learning what they want to do in life. They're still trying to figure it all out. They might really like movies, but they don't know they want to be in film. They might not think they can be in film. What I want you to do is I want you, as you hear it talk to people this weekend, I want you to start for yeah, of course. Beyond. Okay. think beyond just what's on the surface level of the screen. What are they trying to say with the camera movement? What are they trying to say with the frame? You know, doing this workshop is really important because we really believe in creating access. You're good on time. A lot of okay. times kids around here don't have access to things like filmmaking, storytelling. Where's your Yankees hat? <laughs> so to have this opportunity to come over here and use this equipment, okay. have this information for free, especially in an area like this, that's, that's a big opportunity. It was, uh, it was good to meet people. I've got a little bit of networking happening. I was like, it's not about who, who how good you are. You gotta know them too. What's cool, I met David, well, I didn't meet him. I saw David Lowry. We're focusing on seven boxes, six hit code. 
and our zip code leads the state of Texas with incarcerated inmates. Uh, it hosts the household of the Black Man. It's a, it's a digital desk as well. So, you know, there's a lot of resources that we're lacking here, right? And a lot of exposure and opportunities that we really just need access to. Personally, I believe if you're doing the thing you love, you're being successful. Um, so if you can't find the thing you love because you're kind of stuck in this, this box, so to speak, then yeah, this is why it's important to continue to you know, expose them to different opportunities. It's been a journey to get to this moment to show, you know, to be able to make the films that I can make, but it's also been a sign of like, you know, not really, or trying to follow a certain type of route that I thought everybody else was following, especially with all of my other peers that were, you know, making films or doing what they were doing and having to try and take that route and figure out my own. A lot of problems I would run into is that, just as David was saying before about, you know, it being a collaborative effort and everything that you do, it's, that still works, like, in every industry, no matter what it is, right? Meeting those uh, film directors, it was so cool because I liked seeing them give their personal stories, but I would say another one was, well, playing with the camera and stuff. I mean, growing up in a city like this, you need positive things, positive impacts, people that are trying to do positive things for people. Like these kids, my ages, that look like me, everything like that. Film and arts are wonderful. It's a period. It's huge. So, you know, for us, it's feeling the need, right? The kids have a thirst. They have a passion. They want to explore these topics. And what's cool to me is that they got surrounded by a lot of adults who are going to encourage them and affirm them to stay focused on their passion, right? Too many other people might push them away from arts, but nah, let's bring people around and say, nah, pursue the arts. Stick with it. Stick with them. Man, I, I can't stress the importance for Oak Cliff and Oak Cliff Film Festival. It's like for Oak Cliff, it gives uh, people in the community spaces to be and not be in trouble. So I feel like doing stuff like this could open a lot of doors for people. You know, I think for Oak Cliff, partnering with the Oak Cliff Film Festival is perfect because we want to grow and nurture those gifts and talents that the kids have. And if they're passionate about films, hey, let's create a space so they, they can explore it. You guys are bringing those resources to us for free. And that's, that's, that's amazing. Cool. Yeah, so that was a, a, a two-day workshop that we did in May at Four Oak Cliff. Uh, and you saw some of the sponsors that put it together. Uh, and something we're going to do again this year. So. Uh, so if you guys know anybody, uh, high school kids, that's really what we're targeting, high school, maybe early college, but they, they, who they still live in Dallas uh, that want to learn about filmmaking, uh, we'll, we'll post about it pretty soon. Uh, and hopefully we're going to do it again at Four Oak Cliff. Has anybody been out there, seen that place? It's great, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, all right, so I want to talk about another organization uh, that I'm involved in uh, called uh, Top Ten Records that we talked about a second ago earlier. Build this, I'll turn it back up. Um, so Top Ten Records uh, is one of these like, you know, old school places that's been on Jefferson forever, right? We talk about the Texas Theater, we talk about Charcoal Broiler, uh, sometimes Raven's Pharmacy, but it's not really re operated as a pharmacy, so it's a bummer. Uh, it's actually for lease, FYI. Uh, but, um, uh, but Top Ten Records was one that, uh, you know, since I started back at the Texas Theater in 2010, I would go in there and I would talk to this guy, Mike Polk, who was in there every day, or not every day, I would go in there and talk to him on Saturdays when I was just making the rounds on the street. And, and you know, and Mike was getting older. And, um, you know, we figured out a plan, sort of a succession plan for him, so that when he wanted to retire, that we could keep the store going. That was really the thing, because the store basically started in 1956 at this location, same exact location, by a guy named Dub Stark. Um, and, and Dub stole, sold it to, the, sold the business to Mike Polk in 79, and Mike ran it basically for 40 years by himself uh, and with people from the community helping him. But the whole thing is that the place always was a community store, and I always, it always kind of felt, nonprofit may be not the right word, but it always felt like they were doing stuff for the community going back to the 50s. They were the place where like, people went and bought Elvis tickets, and then later on it became a rock and roll store, and then later in the 80s and 90s it became a place where everybody bought their Tejano records, and there were hip hop artists doing signings there, and it was always a place where people bought uh, you know, uh, tickets for all the other events happening in town. So it was really um, a community store from the beginning. So that was the plan, is that we would you know, uh, 
get Mike to agree to kind of turn over the store to a nonprofit, which he did in, in early 2017. And we started a new nonprofit called Oak Cliff Records and Library, which is just DBA Top 10 Records. Because um, there's not the DBA for Top 10 Records, I think, was confused. No, I'm sorry. The Oak Cliff Records uh, was, uh, was what we called it. Um, and we did a, we did a big uh, Kickstarter back then, and we, did, we raised about forty fifty thousand dollars and uh, Doug, you helped with that. Thank you. Uh, given some money to that early on. Uh, and that was gave us the ability to do a renovation in the store, kind of clean up some stuff. There were parts of the store Mike told me he hadn't, he hadn't swept in, since like, since seventy nine. Uh, so, uh, so there was a couple things we had to clean up, but um, it still looks like top ten records, we think. Um, and, it, and, it, and a part of the store looked like it did in 1956. Uh, it hasn't changed that much. And even parts of the store, if you go in, uh, still look like a place called Hamilton's uh, Appliance Repair, um, which is what it was in the early 50s. The place called Ham and they sold, and they sold Philco televisions. Uh, so you'll see if you go in, there's a, there's a Philco sign, which actually predates Top Ten Records. Uh, that, so, and this is where you would buy your televisions back in the day. Um, so, um, uh, it's always interesting. We always talk about, like, we think the top 10 records is probably the, definitely the oldest record store in Dallas. Uh, we think it's the oldest record store in Texas. It's not the oldest record store in the country, it's continuously operating. But uh, w one thing that's interesting, and I don't know if this is, like, a, you know, a thing to be excited about, but we think it's, how long, Monty, maybe you can answer this, how long has one business paid rent in the same location in Dallas. <laughs> this place has been paying rent at 338 Jet Jefferson since 1956. Doesn't, <laughs> uh, isn't that interesting? Uh, so that's something we sometimes think about. And Mike, Mike comes and talks to me about that too, because he, like, he was like, yeah, it was like $50 back then, a month. Uh, obviously, it's gone up since then. And the, and the building's changed ownership. Uh, a lot of Jefferson used to be uh, owned by this guy named Victor Ballas, uh, and he started selling off a, a few years ago. Um, so uh, they actually sold, Victor actually sold this building, which is the same building Zaman is in and a few other pieces are over there that help part of Jefferson, to a, 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 another group. Um, and and the, the group was, was interested in making sure that we got to keep top 10 records, so they, they worked with us. Uh, around 2017 and to start a new lease and, and, and to make it work out so, so Top Ten could stay at this location. Um, you know, I don't know if Top Ten can buy the building, but we'll work on it. Maybe Monty will help us. Um, so um, the other thing about uh, Top Ten, how it, it does connect to the JFK, you know, mystery a little bit. Uh, J.D. Tippett, who many of you guys probably know, was, was shot by Oswald at 10th and Patton. There's a plaque there you can look at. Um, but J.D. Tippett, uh, Dallas police officer, came into Top Ten mysteriously on that day. You, gotta, you, guys, you guys are going to get some Duracells. These are already dead. Um, did they die? Uh, I don't know. But anyway, he came into Top Ten and, uh, and, and used the phone. Why didn't he use the police phone? Uh, we don't know why he didn't use the police phone. right? He needed to make a call. It's actually not the batteries. Oh, uh, okay. It, uh, it died, but um, uh, and uh, so we do. We, we kind of the top ten is kind of the, the tribute to Tippett, right? Uh, so a lot of people talk about tribute to other people involved in Jefferson Boulevard uh, or who are involved in the JFK situation, and uh, and we have plaques up for Tippett. We have uh, uh, things honoring his his legacy. Uh, every eleven twenty two sixty three, we um, we put up some special photos from the Dallas City Archive, uh, kind of talking about uh, JD's life. Um, his wife actually came to the store on 11-22-63 two years ago because she heard about the exhibit on the news. Uh, so there's a photo of that. And she sent us like this nice letter, which she, and she gave us a copy of JD's uh, badge and everything like that. She actually passed only last year. Um, but uh, that, was, that was kind of a, a crazy day. Um, so Top Ten has a separate mission statement, um, which is, uh, you know, to, to sustain this part of Oak Cliff history uh, and also uh, be basically an archive for Texas music and Texas uh, art and, and, and basically music and film. So it functions as a regular, you know, record store. You can go in and buy a record and that's fine. That helps out. Uh, but you can also be a member of Top Ten. We have like a, a yearly membership program and the yearly membership program 
lets people um, loan out some of our rare uh, Texas music. Um, and then we also, Top 10 also applies for grants to do education things, uh, similar to what we talked about with the Oak Cliff Film Festival, but Top 10 does it for, for music industry vocation. You know, we teach young artists um, how to book shows, how to promote their shows, how to make flyers, how to create social media. So, so the team there, uh, is, that's their focus. And then we also do small music shows in the store uh, called the Sounds of Oak Cliff, which we've done for the past few years. Sounds of Oak Cliff has been supported by uh, Office of uh, Cultural Affairs uh, via their Arts Activate grant. Uh, for the past five years, um, and, and really it gives an, a small venue for up and coming artists to play. A lot of times, people who played there for 30 people, have, next they play the Texas Theater for 100 people, next they play the Kessler Theater for 400 people, next they play the Granada for 1,000 people, so they kind of work their way up through the town, um, and, uh, and we're happy when, when that sort of thing happens. Um, I'm posting these little social tags. Hopefully you guys will follow us on the Instagrams and whatnot. Um, so, so yeah, just, just, as a, just as a neat thing, this is like what was happening uh, at, at, over the years at Top 10 Records. I always like to find these old ads, because Top 10, you know, you guys probably remember it from like the 90s or the 2000s, you would go to like Sound Warehouse maybe to buy your tickets. But that was a thing, way, even way back before the Sound Warehouse and stuff, people would go to the local record stores to buy their concert tickets. Um, and Top 10 was like one of the big places to do it. So people bought tickets to this Mahalia Jackson show, a top 10 record shop, 338 West Jefferson. It was one of the only like five places in the city to buy this ticket. And to the Dick Clark show, like the Dick Clark show, there's only four, four places in the city in Dallas. And this one, was, this one was later. This one was kind of interesting. This is a, this guy who uh, won, did a tribute record, which was around 2013. Um, and there was a small in-store. And we have other ones. If you come to the store, we've got other posters like this of, um, of uh, uh, other 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 shows unfortunately we don't have the elvis cotton bowl one which we were a ticket venue for if anybody has a photo of that i would like it um 56 october of 56. but in, in the the legend goes that top 10 records was the uh highest indie store you know they sold the most number of tickets to that elvis show um, I had another awesome photo, which I was looking for just a minute ago, which I was going to talk about how Jefferson has changed over the years, and it's not there. But uh, this is it. Um, I have it somewhere. Uh, if, I had, if I had thought about making this pre show before 9 o'clock last night, I would have had it. I apologize. Um, but there is an awesome photo of people in cars with like high socks drinking soda pop in front of Top Ten Records. But I do have a photo. A few, uh, 20 years later, of, of these guys in front of Top 10 Records. These guys are pretty cool. Uh, so, so this is, they were selling Run DMC and Aerosmith and stuff like that. Um, and this is what the scene was, you know, in the 80s. I mean, this guy looks like, you know, Bon Jovi back there. I don't know, I don't know who these guys are. But, they, but in theory, a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, bands would, would, would stop their, you know, Top 10 Records uh, on their way in and out of town. And, and, and drop off their music uh, to sell. So, um, and then this photo is, you know, maybe late 80s, early 90s, up to the 2000s of, of the scene uh, on Jefferson and Top 10. You know, all these guys are here to get, um, you know, the latest uh, Tejano release. It, it was like a KNON release. This, I think this photo was late 90s, and this one's 80s uh, of people doing in-store signings. The store doesn't look that different. Uh, if, there's, a, there's, there's a little less clutter, but it doesn't look that different if you come in today. And we still try to do in-stores like this. But this kind of just shows you, you know, the demographics change from the 50s to the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s. And, and, uh, and we try to honor all of those eras of music in the store and also the bands that play uh, the, the, the in-stores and also, um, you know, what's, what's being promoted over the years. Uh, and this is when it got rebooted. Um, 2017, um, you know, we kind of try to pay tribute to the Philco television era, um, and, uh, but also show the new store. There's, a little, there's Mike. So Mike stayed on, he ran it from 79 to 2017, but he also stayed on the board. Uh, that was part of, part of his uh, deal, and he wanted to be still involved in a certain level. So he's still there. He's, on, he's a emeritus board member right now. You know, he's about 80 years old, but he still comes in if you want to say hi to him. People, he's a sort of a Jefferson celebrity, if you don't know Mike. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people have been, I mean, I've been on the street for 12 years. Monty's been on the street for 25 years. 
Mike's been on the street for 45 years. Um, and if you go down to Charcoal Boiler, Nick uh, Cordova, those guys have been there since, you know, their family's been there even longer. But uh, there's not a lot of people who've had, you know, years and years and years and decades and decades of, of experience on, on, on Jefferson. And people come in every day and they're like, where's Mike? I want to talk to Mike. Uh, they don't even want to buy records. It's totally fine. Right, Doug, right? You agree. You know this, right? Um, they just want to talk to him. And uh, so he, he's sort of a, the local shaman of, of Jefferson Boulevard. So if you want to say hi to him, he's sometimes there Saturday afternoons. Um, and then I'm going to show you a really short little video of, of, of the little campaign thing we just did for Top Ten uh, at how you know, we talk about it in terms, of, uh, in terms of fundraising a little bit for North Texas Giving Day and other events. That's all I got. Um, just, just a you know, a little recap. Follow, follow the things on the Instagrams and the Twitters if you feel like. Um, as Top Ten takes donations, you can also just buy records there. That's how, that's a one way you can help Top Ten Records. Um, Oak Cliff Film Festival. We're also looking for filmmaker submissions, but we're also looking for sponsors. If your if your company, if your small company uh, is interested in some branding and they want you want your 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 brand in the film festival program on screen, if you have commercials you made uh, to promote your brand uh, and anything you do branding wise for the Oak Cliff Film Festival is a, is a tax deductible uh, donation. And the Texas Theater is looking for people who want to go out and, and see a movie and maybe have a good time and get a drink. So, uh, so those are the things we're looking for on Jefferson. Um, and uh, somebody mentioned earlier, there is like a, you know, there, there was, a, it still sort of is, there's a, there's a Jefferson Boulevard Alliance, which was a group that really was there to, um, you know, curb some of the crime. Uh, you know, Jefferson Boulevard, you know, it comes and goes just like every other part of Dallas, but, um, but it still sort of exists and, and probably could, you know, could be leveraged to do uh, new, new things. Um, so who has questions about anything we've been talking about? We got minutes for some questions if you guys want. So any, any questions? Who's going to come see Halloween ends? <laughs> Are you guys into that? You're not into Halloween? No? Yeah. Um, did you uh, mention anything about your Tuesday Night Trash at the Texas Theater? I didn't talk about it, but Tuesday Night Trash is something we've been doing for 12 years at Texas Theater. It's uh, once a month on a Tuesday. It's free, and we show uh, you know B movies upstairs or any downstairs usually. I mean, and and it's 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 meant to be like a free event, uh, and it's been great. You've been doing it before? Oh yeah. 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 I love it. Excellent. Yeah. There's usually tape trading in the lobby. Right now we have a. Uh, we have another room which I, called the safe room, which is a gallery space upstairs at the Texas Theater. Uh, and we call it the safe room because it has a giant safe in it, uh, which we think was Howard Hughes's safe. Um, and, uh, and it's been a rotating gallery space uh, for different things over the years. But right now it's a fake video store called the Video Crypt. Uh, so if you want to go, if you want to see what a video store from the 90s looked like today, come to the Texas Theater and go upstairs to the Video Crypt. It's a new installation. It's open all the whole month of October. You guys are selling Video Crypt shirts? We are selling Video Crypt shirts, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I put some of these up. If you, if you, there's some of the stuff we've got coming around. I usually put these around. I'm going to start bringing them to put on your fridge. You've got all this nice fridge space. Um, but yeah, Doug, what do you got? Um, so I was, I had like, I was, I really wanted to do this movie theater thing and I, I, there was a space in Denton, I went to school in Denton and we were trying to do it in Denton and, uh, and that didn't work out for various reasons and I, and I came at it from the filmmaker perspective because I was like, we need a place for indie filmmakers to show their films and I felt like there was a lot of, a lot of movies that weren't being shown and then other film festival style movies that weren't being shown. Um, and, uh, so we had a business plan to basically be able to present those kinds of films uh, in Denton, and when that didn't work out, you know, I was I looked at other places in Dallas, um, and then I'd had a film that was needed a place to show, and 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 I heard because of what was happening at the Oak Cliff Foundation that the, there was sort of pop-ups happening DIY style, 
And you know, a lot of times you go into these old theaters, uh, and I've been to a kajillion of them since, and like, you know, um, they're in really bad shape. You can't, you can't. There's no electricity even. But, 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 but between you know, 2001 and 2009, the Oak Cliff Foundation had done a, a great amount of infrastructure work and put in new electrical and toilets and air conditioning. And there just, there just wasn't like an fs and &E build out. But a lot of the infrastructure, credit to, to Monty and the Oak Cliff Foundation, they were getting it ready for a tenant, right? So, so, uh, so we just did a pop-up screening there, and I was like, well, maybe I can. Maybe I can talk to these guys. Maybe we can do something here. And, and, and all we had to do, basically, was come up with the money for the FF&E uh, and, then, and then the lease. And then that was, that was, that was great. So, so if any, you know, people are always like, how do we take over an old theater? I was like, first, you know, put some toilets in it. You know, <laughs> don't put the movie screen first. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so you know, kudos to, uh, to that organization to make it happen. Yeah. I think we have one more question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm the board chair. So we, so the Oak Cliff Film Festival, Oak Cliff Film Society, is its own nonprofit. Yeah. Okay. So I'm the board chair of the film festival and the record store, and then I run the theater separate. Are you guys connected to anyone, or possibly like, have you ever considered incorporating any kind of like um, audio medium for like poetry or like spoken word literature for like high school kids or or uh, young college kids or anything like that? I mean, we have it, but we could. You know, no reason why we couldn't. Yeah. yeah. Is, that, is that your world? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, you know, and you should also come talk to us at the record store, because we, we do small spoken word type performances there. That might be a, a good avenue for you. Um, and again, some of those, if, if, you were, if you were chosen for uh, Sounds of Oak Cliff, part of what Sounds of Oak Cliff does to the record store is not only gives people a place to perform and do their thing, because we get this grant, Everybody gets paid and gets paid probably too much to do a small thing for 20 people. But it's part of the mission of the grant to, to, to make sure that people are getting paid. And you don't just get money. You have to send an invoice. You know what I mean? Like we, we try to make it like people, how do you get paid? How do you, how do you monetize your work and, that, and, uh, and, and do it correctly? So that's part of the, what we're doing there. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you for All right. Oh, wait. We got another one. Sorry. Just out of curiosity. Yeah. Um, excited about this Hocus Pocus movie. Yeah, you should come to that. Okay, so there's going to be ballet going on during the film? Not during the film. We do this thing, we've done it before, where the ball it's like a ballet pre-show, like a theme to the movie, you know? So they'll come out, like, I think the show's at 5 o'clock, so from 5 to 5, 20, like a 20-minute pre-show, they'll come out and do some ballet, we take an intermission, then we show the movie. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's give Barack another round of applause. Thank you.